Well, Georgetown sociology professor Michael Eric Dyson has a solution to white privilege. He says white Americans ought to create individual reparations accounts to compensate black Americans for centuries of oppression. Professor Dyson joins us now to explain how that would work and why. Professor, great to see you. Good to see you, my so friend. So how would this work and why? Well, yeah. Well, it's in the context, let me just briefly say, it's in the context of a much broader discussion about right. white privilege, white innocence, white American identity, and it's much more complicated than that, and I go at African-American uh, cultures, contradictions as well. And then in the end, when I'm making suggestions about what can be done, many white people approach me and ask me, what can I do? Not in terms of the broad social transformation out there in the world. We all believe in that or argue about it, redistribution of resources or not. But when people ask me, what can I as an individual do, one of the things I suggested besides being educated, besides participating with other African-American and Latino and other brothers and sisters in social movement, is to do something called an individual repair of uh, inequality. And if they feel inclined to do so, this is for people who are so inclined to seek out a way to compensate uh, individually for what they think is a systemic injustice. So I talked about buying kids computers, um, being able to take kids to school, uh, to tutor them, to be able to do individual things that are tailored to their uh, desires and aspirations, right. such as becoming professionals, uh, exposing them to things they wouldn't ordinarily see. So in other words, it's a, a kind of ethic of compassion joined to a sense of conscience that motivates them to do what they're mo motivated to do. Well, so I support a lot of that. I mean, I believe sure. in charity. What mm -hmm. I don't believe in is collective guilt, mm -hmm. and that's why I'm confused by by the phrase white privilege. Well, white privilege doesn't suggest guilt. It suggests responsibility and accountability. The same well, accountability that America talks to no. about people pulling up themselves by their bootstraps and addressing their, 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 their situations, their communities as being responsible for doing what they're doing. I don't, I don't believe in collective guilt, but I do believe in collective responsibility. Responsibility and guilt are synonyms in this case. And no, let me just ask, let's be specific. Mm -hmm. So, um, privilege. I, I'm privileged, and I wouldn't deny that, not because sure. I'm white, because I have a good-paying job. Mm -hmm. But you're privileged, too. Of course So I we live near each other in a nice neighborhood. Mm -hmm. You're rich. You went to an Ivy League school, unlike me. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so you're way more privileged than most white Americans. Well, so why would they open but it's not something? Well, first of all, privilege is contingent upon the context in which it's defined. So individual cases could, could have a, an imbalance, that people of color could be way more privileged, as you talked about, than the average, say, white person. But remember, during Jim Crow, Jackie Robinson was more privileged than most white people in terms of having the ability to make a good living on a job, but he was still denied access to a water fountain. His kids still couldn't go to For the same sure. school. So I'm saying to you that your argument then seems to be rather uh, vulnerable to rebuff because it doesn't mean economic uh, accumulation can prevent you from experiencing what are essentially uh, racial inequalities. So I think the amount of money you have doesn't do that. Yeah, and in 1955, I think that was much truer than it is now. Well, even now, when we talk about uh, the disparities in terms of people's achievement, they, a study was done by Diva Pager at Princeton University that said a black person with a college education had less of a chance to get a job than a white person who had gone to prison. So even now, I'm not talking about 50 years ago, I'm talking okay. about this is going on right now. The disparities are very real. Right. So if I live in eastern Kentucky mm -hmm. and I am unemployed, why am I more privileged than you? And why am I in any way, as you put it, responsible for problems of people I've never met on the other side of the country? Look, I mean, we know that larger forces provide people opportunities or disadvantages. When you come, many people say, let me even stretch it even further. Some people say, look, I came to this country 20 years ago. I came to this country 30 years ago. I didn't, I wasn't advantaged directly by the system of enslavement that prevailed in America. But if you come to this country as an immigrant and you're a white immigrant and you inherit certain privileges associated with people who were already here, that means that that privilege extends to you regardless of the fact that you indirectly benefited from it and you right. did not directly contribute to inequality. The Constitution was written a long time ago, so was the Declaration of Independence. But those ancient documents continue to inform people's lives and shape their aspirations. So uh, let me flip it around. And let me just also note there's a lot of hostility in what you're saying. And I'm sure you'll say there isn't, but obviously there is. Not at all. I think it's pretty clear. It's his recogni recognition of the situation. Okay. It's pushback on it's whiteness that is usually not called out. Clearly hostile. But leaving that aside, mm -hmm. I'll flip around for a sec. If I'm an African immigrant mm -hmm. who comes here, I'm resettled right. from Somalia at public right. expense, mm -hmm. high public expense, right. am I do these reparations too? I think that the people who have benefited from uh, systemic inequity in this country have been overwhelmingly white brothers and sisters. And what I'm talking about is a direct relationship to a notable 
and a documentable and an empirically verifiable system of inequality. There's, no, there's nothing uh, that's very obscure about that. And I'm saying to you that people of color who are here now, who have inherited that legacy as a result of their black skin and their relationship to black culture, okay. have to be acknowledged. Well, wait, but, but, I mean, but, my book, but my book, my book is not simply about reparations. You're reducing I, I know, it I know that to it's, one thing. I know that it's, it's not. But so it's, much it's, larger it's heavily about privilege. That. But let me just I really it's about we're innocence. almost out of it's time. It's about white refusal to acknowledge if responsibility. If a majority white country brings mm -hmm. in a black African at its mm -hmm. own expense, mm -hmm. they still owe him reparations for slavery? No, the, I'm talking about the people who are here. That's a that's an isolated event. I'm talking about the mass, the majority okay. of African American people who are here, who are right. part and parcel of what this country has been and who have built it in its institutions to become what it is now. If you want to know more about this argument, you can read this book, Tears We Cannot Stop, Michael Eric Dyson. Thanks a lot, Professor. Good to see you. Always good to see you, my Thank brother.